Good morning. I'm Jane Dropa, and on behalf of the Friends of the National World War II Memorial, I offer our thanks and appreciation to Lieutenant General Plain and the National Defense University for hosting today's 10th annual Hayden Williams World War II Memorial Legacy Lecture. It is my great delight and honor to be able to introduce this year's Legacy Lecturer. Ian Toll is the world-renowned, best-selling author of four superb works of American military history, including a definitive trilogy about the Pacific War. A highly regarded speaker, he has served as a juror for the National Endowment for the Humanities, a cultural ambassador for the U.S. State Department, and a lecturer at the Naval War College. Mr. Toll received an undergraduate degree in American history at Georgetown University and a master's in public policy from Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. It is no exaggeration to say that Mr. Toll is regarded by many as the finest living historian of the Pacific War. Mr. Toll. Thank you very much, and good morning. It's my, it's my honor to be here. Uh, military history involves, of course, war on land, war on sea, the history of armies, the history of navies, ground forces, and fleets. And these have often been treated as separate domains, distinct and specialized fields, uh, distinct genres of military history. My subject today is amphibious warfare, a branch of military uh, strategy and operations that fuses these domains together. Amphibious warfare, that is, to strike an enemy on land, but to do it by way of sea, to land an invasion force on a well-defended enemy coast, has been the most perilous of all major military operations, and to be confident of victory, the attacker must possess overwhelming advantages, control of the surrounding sea, control of the air above the objective, a heavy bombardment of enemy positions to precede the landing, followed by rapid delivery of ground forces and heavy weaponry to the beaches. Uh, rapidity is essential because you must establish a critical mass of force ashore quickly. Uh, if the attacker can achieve surprise, the initial risks uh, would be greatly mitigated. But even if that first attack is successful, uh, the uh, force ashore must receive constant resupply by sea and, uh, and the maintenance of re reliable air protection overhead. These are what I think uh, are the eternal verities of amphibious warfare. Certainly these uh, principles applied during the Second World War and during the Pacific War, which is my area of special expertise. Uh, I will argue that they apply equally today. The Second World War was the moment when amphibious warfare uh, rose to prominence and fulfilled its potential. Driven by convergent advances in technology and by critical military necessity, by the last year of the war in both Europe and the Pacific, amphibious warfare uh, had uh, arrived and the Allies had demonstrated that they could do something that really had never been done before in history. To land an army on any coast, no matter how well defended by the enemy, to establish a secure beachhead to maintain that invasion force with resupply and reinforcements from the sea, and to expand that beachhead uh, until the battle was won. In May 1940, after the fall of France, after the miracle of Dunkirk, when the British Army was evacuated under the noses of the German Army, uh, Britain then stood alone against Nazi Germany, which occupied and dominated the European continent. Uh, threatened with invasion, uh, Britain's first line of defense, most important line of defense, was its ancient natural moat, the English Channel, 22 miles wide at its narrowest point. And Hitler 
like Bonaparte before him, uh, considered the problem of invading England uh, across that channel and concluded that it was not possible. And like Bonaparte before him, then turned his attention to Russia and eventually to his doom. Even in that dire season of 1940, British leaders could look forward into the future and anticipate another problem. They and their American allies, from the point of view of 1940, they're still hopeful in that respect that we would join uh, this conflict, uh, would sooner or later confront the same problem in reverse. To roll back Hitler's conquest of Europe, uh, they would have to send their armies back across the English Channel. And unlike in World War I, when France controlled that coast, controlled seaports, and the Allies were able to ship their uh, armies and supplies in through those ports, uh, <clears throat> the Germans held the entire coast, including all the ports, all possible landing beaches, uh, which were fortified and defended heavily against invasion. That cross-channel invasion uh, to land a very large army on a hostile shore, eventually named Overlord, would be something new under the sun, a military undertaking of unprecedented scale and complexity. In the Pacific, of course, the war uh, began 18 months later with a Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. And in the 10 weeks that followed, Japanese sea, air, and land forces launched a naval amphibious blitzkrieg across the Pacific to the south and east, uh, an initial offensive which moved with extraordinary speed and success. Japanese forces taking Guam, the Philippines, Malaya, Burma, Hong Kong, the Dutch East Indies, various island groups of Southern Oceania as far east as the Solomons. In less than four months, the Japanese gained one of the largest empires ever to be brought under one flag. <clears throat> the Americans considering uh, this problem from the smoking uh, rubble of Pearl Harbor, uh, realized that to win this war, uh, we would need to seize one island after another across the largest ocean in the world, advancing across thousands of miles of ocean in two huge parallel offensives on either side of the equator, and would have to fight our way ashore on more than 50 islands occupied by the enemy, uh, often to land in small craft on beaches defended by Japanese troops dug into prepared positions, pillboxes, blockhouses, uh, with a clear field of fire directly over the landing beaches uh, and to overcome a fanatical enemy that would never surrender, an enemy sworn to fight to the last ditch and the last man. The Pacific War would be the largest, the bloodiest, the most costly, the most technically innovative, most logistically complex amphibious war in history. That was the challenge that we faced at the outset of the Second World War. So the Allies knew that they would have to master the challenges opposed by amphibious operations. It was a daunting prospect. Prior to the Second World War, there had been very little pre-war planning or systematic preparation for amphibious war. And among professional military thinkers, planners, strategists of many nations, uh, including this one, uh, the efforts to plan for uh, amphibious warfare had been half-hearted and desultory. A prevailing opinion held that it was simply impossible to land uh, an invasion force by sea on a strongly defended coast, that such an operation was too, too risky and should not be attempted. These planners were influenced by their study of the largest previous attempt uh, to land ground forces on a defended shore, the Gallipoli campaign in the Dardanelles during the First World War, when British and Empire troops landed on the peninsula and tried to attack inland. Uh, and were stopped by uh, the Turks dug into defensive positions. Uh, this debacle after several months uh, resulted in a decision by the British to abandon the attempt, withdraw their remaining forces after the loss of some 180,000 British Empire and Allied troops, uh, including nearly 50,000 killed in action. Uh, between the world wars, the U.S. Army had invested little effort in study, studying or preparing for amphibious war. I think with the understanding that another war in Europe would uh, be very much like the First World War, where we would have access to ports in France. Um, <clears throat> so to the U.S. Navy, uh, the top brass of the 1920s and 30s, uh, 
uh, were largely focused on other things, and there was a lot to focus on, let's face it, in those years, the development of carrier aviation, submarines, uh, lots, of, lots of new technologies, lots of new toys uh, to play with, uh, largely neglected the subject of amphibious warfare. Also lack of funding, an important factor. Uh, and so there was a little done in the way of developing the specialized equipment, the training programs, the doctrines, uh, to wage uh, amphibious war. So it really fell to the Marine Corps uh, in the 1930s in particular to take the lead in studying and preparing for amphibious operations. And uh, some of the leaders of that era, notably General John Lejeune, envisioned the Marines as a specialist force for amphibious operations, a shock force uh, that could be landed on a hostile shore by the Navy establish a beachhead and clear the way for the Army to come in behind them. Uh, Pre-war amphibious exercises uh, off of Puerto Rico uh, convinced many Marine leaders and some Navy leaders uh, that these operations would become feasible. And they began to develop the doctrines and tactics to mount such operations. Marine planners took an interest in the flat bottom boats that were used widely in the South and in the Gulf of Mexico uh, in rivers and Louisiana bayous the Higgins boat, the LCVP, uh, small boats, uh, 36, long, 36 feet long, 15,000 pounds, which drew only about three feet, built of oak, pine, and mahogany, carried about 30 men or a platoon, unloaded by a bow or stern ramp. Andrew Higgins uh, was a Nebraskan who moved to uh, the Gulf Coast in the early 1900s and developed these types of boats uh, for various uses in timber and oil industry, uh, dredging operations by the Army Corps of Engineer, Engineers. Uh, they became high performance speed boats for rum runners racing whiskey past the Coast Guard. In 1938, he owned a single small boatyard in New Orleans, uh, employing 75 people. After the Marines and Navy uh, decided to adopt his boat as their principal landing craft for amphibious operations, and the Second World War began, his business swelled rapidly. By 1943, Higgins industry had, Industries had seven plants uh, employing some 20,000 people, and some 23,000 of these boats were built during the war. Uh, there was also an array of different types of landing craft and amphibious vehicles, some small, some large, for different purposes, all de designated with acronyms beginning with L for landing. Uh, notably, the LVT landing vehicle tract was an amphibious tractor, often called the Amtrak. Uh, these little vehicles had treads like tanks and could be transported in tank landing ships, LSTs, and launched directly into the sea uh, two or three miles from a, beach, uh, a landing beach. Um, <clears throat> they then could actually run up the beach even in the face of fire uh, to uh, deliver troops ashore. No less a figure than Dwight D. Eisenhower later credited the Higgins boat as a critical factor in the Allied victory uh, on the Western Front, told his biography that, biographer that if the U.S. had not had the Higgins boat, uh, we never could have landed over an open beach, and the whole strategy of the war uh, would have been different. The presence of Higgins Industries in New Orleans is the reason the National World War II Museum is located there. Amphibious warfare, uh, really by its very nature, if you think about it, uh, requires close cooperation between the different branches of the armed forces. The sea, the ground, the air forces all have essential roles to perform in any amphibious invasion. And if any one part of the force fails to do its part, the entire operation uh, may fall to pieces. So close coordination, timing, uh, blended command hierarchies, joint planning, uh, adaptability, the ability to learn from errors, the quality of leadership essentially, all of this, all of these factors are absolutely, absolutely essential in this uh, very difficult uh, branch of uh, warfare. Uh, in the Second World War, the Army, the Navy, the Marines were compelled to work together in sustained and intricate cooperation in the Pacific in particular. Inevitably, these operations tended to exacerbate 
are rivalries, natural rivalries uh, between the services, the eternal contest for resources and influence and prestige that has always characterized relationships between armies and navies of every nation, not only in the USA. Frictions at every part of the command chain, from the top brass in Washington to the en enlisted personnel in the field. Uh, the tension between the Army and the Navy really goes back to the American Revolution in this country. The Marines have also uh, founded during the Revolution have, had never been entirely reconciled to their subordinate role within the uh, Navy organization. And Marine leaders of the pre-World War II period hoped to establish the Corps as an independent service, a goal which has largely been achieved. Holland Smith, Howling Mad Smith was his nickname, was the highest ranking uh, Marine in the Pacific, a lieutenant general who uh, wrote a bitter score-settling post-war memoir that attacked both the Navy and the Army. We had generals who were admirals, and admirals who wanted to be generals. Generals acting as admirals are bad enough. This was a reference to MacArthur. But it was the admirals who wanted to be generals who imperiled victory among the Coral Islands. Smith charged that uh, the Marines had been required to make do with the Navy's obsolete cast-off equipment. He recalled budget fights before the Second World War when he was trying to obtain trucks to haul artillery shells. A Navy supply officer asked, why don't you do like the Army and use mules and wagons to haul ammunition? Smith said, there are enough jackasses in the Navy to do the pulling, but where would we get the wagons? <laughs> uh, many Army uh, leaders of that era resented uh, the growth of the Marine Corps and the soaring prestige of the Marine Corps during the Second World War. Uh, suspected that the Navy was essentially conspiring to sort of usurp their rightful function. Uh, felt that it was essentially wrong uh, for the Navy to be able to build its own ground force, and they tried to limit marine deployments. Uh, and a major controversy erupted during the latter part of the war uh, when the Army uh, basically declared uh, that they were going to refuse to allow Army troops to serve under Marine commanders. Uh, a um, controversy that was eventually escalated to the level of the Joint Chiefs and even the President of the United States. Uh, there were major fights within military aviation, of course. Uh, the rivalry between the Air Force and uh, naval aviation arm is legendary, con continues today. Uh, <clears throat> and much of this um, rivalry really is rooted in the history of the Second World War, particularly in the Pacific. In general, I think it's uh, correct to say that the military services of this country uh, were, were not prepared to act uh, in joint operations prior to the Second World War. They had little practice of it. Uh, there was little history of joint operations and planning. There were various liaison bodies that met to discuss uh, plans, but really the Army and the Navy were going in their own directions. There was no Defense Department. There was no Secretary of Defense. Since the administration of John Adams, the Army and Navy establishments had been organized under two separate departments, the War and Navy departments, independent and co-equal, each headed by a civilian cabinet secretary who reported to the president. There was no mechanism to resolve disputes between them except appealing the issue directly to the White House. After Pearl Harbor, uh, there was a, a demand, essentially a surge in demand, anger, uh, that erupted in Congress in particular, in the press, and among the American people at large. Uh, how could this have happened? How could our fleet have been surprised at Pearl Harbor? Um, what were the failures? Uh, whose heads are going to roll? And there, were, uh, there was a demand uh, to reform the military, and uh, the rallying cry became service unification. We have to reorganize the military uh, we have to rationalize, streamline the uh, organizational chart. We have to force these services to work together. And of course, this was an immense reform, an immensely difficult thing to do, immensely complex. FDR agreed uh, that service unif unification reforms were necessary. 
But he persuaded the Congress to postpone those reforms until the war was won, wisely, I think. The service chiefs, though, knew that the whole, this whole military organizational chart was going to be reorganized as soon as the war was won. Therefore, during the war, really, the services are positioning themselves in anticipation of this tremendous political and bureaucratic struggle that they saw coming. Uh, <clears throat> during the war, uh, we did have something called the Joint Chiefs of Staff. But this was an ad hoc uh, organization. Essentially, the chiefs uh, met in Washington and decided to call themselves the Joint Chiefs. The JCS, during the Second World, World War, had no statutory authority. It had no, no official chairman. Uh, it was an informal organization in which uh, Admiral William Leahy, who was the uh, senior officer on the panel, was sort of hailed by acclamation by his colleagues as the chairman because of his seniority. So this four-headed Joint Chiefs of Staff essentially was making military policy during this largest and bloodiest of all wars, was doing it by consensus, not by vote, all four had to agree. And they all knew that if they, uh, if they had some, uh, if they ever deadlocked, if they ever failed to come to, to a, a consensus understanding of what they must do, that their only recourse then would be to go to FDR and ask him to decide. And none of them wanted to do that. So that was the pressure uh, that they felt to muddle through, to agree, if necessary, to haggle, to horse trade. Many of the most important decisions of the war, particularly in the way that the Pacific uh, command structure was set up in 1942, was essentially agreed by Ernest J. King, the Chief of Naval Operations, George Marshall, the Army Chief of Staff, in face-to-face -face meetings. Often they were alone with no staff in the room, uh, left no detailed notes for the historical record, and essentially hashed this thing out. The decision that they came to was, we're gonna do the King Solomon thing. We're simply gonna draw a line down the middle of the Pacific. We're gonna let the Army run the war on one side of that line and the Navy on the other side. So in the North Pacific, north of the equator, uh, we had one theater. Uh, Chester Nimitz was our theater commander there. And to the south, <clears throat> uh, uh, at a, a long, point of longitude uh, going to, uh, through, uh, between Australia and New Zealand, uh, of course, you had General MacArthur there in the Southwest Pacific area. Uh, both uh, of these theater commanders were reporting to the Joint Chiefs, so there was no way to resolve disputes in the Pacific. Those had to be elevated to Washington. <clears throat> Predictably, uh, the way the war uh, went is that both of these two theaters launched their own counteroffensives, and the Pacific War was therefore fought with two parallel offenses. Uh, lines of allied advance on both sides of the equator. Other nations, uh, particularly the British, our British allies, thought this arrangement was preposterous and they were not wrong. Uh, this was uh, essentially a way of resolving a deadlock between the services. As it turned out though, the US economy was large enough to supply the needed shipping troops, aircraft, and war supplies to support these two offensives. And it turned out that the scheme did have some real advantages. The Japanese could not concentrate their defenses against either prong of this double-headed advance. Chester Nimitz, commander-in-chief of the Pacific Fleet, whose immense theater command took in about one-fifth of the surface of the Earth, it was a multi-service theater command. Uh, he was in charge of the Army, uh, the Air Forces, of the Marines, and had to make these services work together to launch the Central Pacific Offensive. Nimitz was the right man for this job. His gentle style of leadership, his soft-spoken uh, manner, his, um, uh, his even-handedness in hearing everyone's point of view, uh, he skillfully kept his team unified sometimes with the use of a well-applied joke. After a testy planning session in early 1944 uh, in his headquarters in Hawaii, uh, 
Admiral Nimitz said he was reminded of history's first amphibious operation conducted by NOAA. And when they were unloading from the ark, he saw a pair of cats come out followed by six kittens. What's this? asked Noah. Ha ha, said the tabby cat. And all the time you thought we were fighting. <clears throat> the Pacific uh, counteroffensive uh, began in August 1942, remarkably, remarkably early as it turned out, with the invasion of Guadalcanal. Immediately after the American victory at the Battle of Midway in June 1942, Admiral King persuaded his fellow Joint Chiefs to order an invasion of the island that lay at the easternmost extremity of Japan's uh, captured empire, the island of Guadalcanal in the Solomons. This order uh, came down without any advance warning of any kind and a, uh, a deadline for this invasion was given of uh, August 1st, 1942. The local commanders, Navy and Marine, in the South, Marines uh, in the South Pacific had not anticipated this order. It came as a thunderbolt out of a blue sky. They had five weeks to prepare the largest uh, amphibious landing since Gallipoli. Uh, they would have to uh, launch it in the Solomon Islands, one of the most primitive and inaccessible theaters of the war. Their logistics were not yet in place. Uh, their naval bases in the region did not yet have adequate fuel reserves. The 1st Marine Division, the landing force, had left their training base at New, Ri New River, North Carolina, less than a month earlier. Uh, and two-thirds of those forces were still at sea. Uh, General uh, Vandegrift, the division commander, had counted on another six months of training in theater before combat deployment. Ammunition of every category and caliber was in short supply. The supporting air bases were not close enough. Uh, another air base would be needed within 500 miles of the objective. And that air base would have to be built, carved out of the jungle in less than five weeks. Uh, <clears throat> Admiral John S. Slew McCain, grandfather of the late senator, uh, was the South Pacific Air Commander. He personally chose the location for this air base in the New Hebrides at Espiritu Santos uh, by essentially flying around the island and looking down from the air. Pointed to a spot and said, we'll put it there. Uh, the local the theater commanders in the South Pacific uh, got together and essentially agreed that this operation was very unwise, uh, that it should be at the very least postponed. Admiral Gormley, the South Pacific Naval Commander, uh, General Vandegrift, the Marine Commander, General MacArthur uh, from the, uh, nearby, his nearby theater in Australia, sent a joint cable to the JCS uh, recommending postponement of the operation. They had many good reasons which they spelled out clearly. And two days later, the response came back, in effect saying, your views are noted, now execute the operation as ordered. Admiral King uh, would move the deadline back by six days to August 7th. So the planners nicknamed this operation Shoestring. It was the first major offensive action taken by the US anywhere in the world. The first attempt to take territory occupied by the Axis anywhere in the world. The 1st Marine Division landed on October 7th, and a hard-fought six-month campaign uh, followed. Air, sea, uh, and ground operations, seven major naval battles, constant daily air battles over the island, Japanese counter-invasions, uh, uh, bitter and bloody ground fighting. In February 1943, the Japanese finally gave up and evacuated their remaining troops. Uh, the losses had been heavy on both sides and remarkably equivalent. Uh, between 30 and 40 ships were lost by each side, between 600 and 17 airplanes. Troop losses, however, much worse for the Japanese and also pilot losses. Most critically, uh, the American economy then mobilizing quickly for war was able to replace those losses. The Japanese could not replace their losses. And so this began, uh, began the war of attrition that would eventually lead to Japanese defeat. In the end then, Admiral King's insistence 
uh, really standing alone against the um, united opinion of the local commanders uh, that we must go early. We must begin this counteroffensive uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, that decision was vindicated. It may have been true uh, that the Allies did not yet have sufficient naval power, air power, logistics capability uh, to begin a responsible amphibious operation in the South Pacific, but the Japanese were at a similar disadvantage. They were not ready. More time uh, might have allowed the Navy and Marines to improve the situation, to put their logistics on a sounder footing, and so forth. Time would also strengthen the defenders, give them more time to dig themselves into the territory they had seized. And the Allies fought an aggressive war in the Pacific, always attacking earlier than they would have liked, and field commanders often felt rushed, felt that they were working against oppressive deadlines, uh, always um, felt as if they ought to ask for more time, uh, deficient or awkward logistics, uh, and they were making many mistakes, and they knew it. But they were learning as they went along. They had uh, a commitment to learn how to fight by fighting. Uh, and the United States had the luxury to make these mistakes uh, because they had the time and the distance uh, to do these things in a clumsy way, as they often did, particularly in those early amphibious invasions, uh, to learn and improve as they went along. Uh, they developed uh, a bypassing strategy. They took islands only when those islands were needed as a sea ba uh, naval base or an air base or both. And if an island was not needed, the Allies merely leaped past them and let the Japanese defenders wither on the vine. The Americans always uh, came before they were anticipated and after the war, uh, the Japanese uh, military leadership uh, admitted that they had often been obliged to fight earlier than they would have liked. Uh, Admiral Kisaburo Nomura, for example, told American interrogators shortly after the end of the war, everywhere I think you attacked before the defense was ready. You came far more quickly than we expected. So two offensives in the Pacific South, beginning in Guadalcanal, terminating in the Philippines, and through the Central Pacific, from Hawaii directly west, uh, through the tiny Micronesian archipelagos of the Gilberts and the Marshalls to the Marianas. And by 1944, uh, the United States had the amphibious game well in hand. The fully mobilized American war economy had put an end to the era of shortfalls. Amphibious operations of previously unimaginable scale were now possible. American forces had made more than 30 amphibious landings north and south of the equator. And they had learned from their mistakes. They had honed their techniques. They had refined their doctrines. And they had trained their new personnel. And they had produced seasoned veterans who knew what they were doing at every level of the command chain, critically, I think, among the NCOs. Efficiencies were being identified and corrected. Procedures steadily improved as all personnel learned from experience. Pre-war ideas concerning major amphibious operations uh, had been rendered obsolete. The immense power of the Pacific Fleet to sweep, to sweep away air opposition uh, above the beaches had completely altered uh, notions of how air power could and should be used. In major operations and raids of early 1944, Task Force 58, the fast carrier task force, uh, began to reveal the scale of its overwhelming strength. Essex-class carriers with new generation carrier fighters and bombers uh, were escorted by new Iowa-class fast battleships, uh, 45,000 ton Leviathans. And these task forces could move uh, at 20 knots for days uh, without uh, dropping the pace and could dial up 30 knots for combat operations. Uh, carrier fighters and bombers provided air cover for every major amphibious invasion of the period, including those in both Nimitz's and MacArthur's theaters, sometimes striking targets north and south of the equator in the same week. It turned out that land-based air cover was no longer the sine qua non of amphibious invasions. Uh, carrier uh, air power could wipe out air defenses over the landing beaches 
and then could stay and defend the fleet and defend the beachhead uh, for as long as necessary. Uh, this allowed amphibious forces then to cross thousands of miles of ocean to land on an enemy coast. Nearby uh, islands and bases were not needed. Bolder, more ambitious strokes were possible. The United States Marine Corps was built up to its peak uh, in uh, the end of the war. Six Marine divisions. The six Marine divisions, still the highest numbered division in Marine Corps history. Total Marine strength during World War II, about 600,000 Marines, of whom 90% served abroad. June 1944 was the month the Allies secured their victory. Two huge landings on either side of the Eurasian landmass, both against heavily fortified shores, overlord the D-Day landings in Normandy. And then less than two weeks later, the forager landings on the island of Saipan. These two uh, immense amphibious operations occurred in the same month. Uh, and each of them surpassed all previous amphibious landings in scale and sophistication. This was a supreme demonstration of American military industrial hegemony. Uh, and this was the month that Allied victory in the Second World War was assured in both theaters. Uh, having established a firm foothold in northern France, given that the Russians were also closing in on Germany from the east, it was apparent that Nazi Germany must fall. Uh, in the Pacific, the capture of the Mariana Islands, the ruin of Japanese carrier air power, were final and irreversible blows to the Japanese imperial project. Marianas airfields uh, provided a base from which the big new B-29 bombers uh, could strike the population and industrial centers of the Kanto Plain, the industrial heartland of Japan and the capital, Tokyo. Americans had demonstrated that they could win dominion of the skies anywhere in the Pacific with carrier air power alone, that they could leap across long ocean distances to invade well-defended continental land masses, and that the naval air amphibious juggernaut could move faster and farther than the enemy had imagined possible. And in that last year of the war, uh, Japan was essentially fighting to defend its home soil even if they didn't ad admit it. The Tokyo regime was clutching at the hope uh, that further exhibitions of fanatical resistance uh, might force the Allies to the negotiating table. And they hoped that the Americans would flinch uh, from the necessity of launching a direct invasion of Japan. As it turned out, of course, no invasion of Japan was necessary, partly due to the atomic bomb, not only due to that. Uh, but if it uh, had been necessary, the Allies had the forces and the plans in place uh, to invade Japan and to do it successfully. It would have been a, a terrible uh, trial, uh, both for uh, the Allied landing forces and for the Japanese. But operations uh, Olympic and Coronet uh, would have been the largest amphibious campaigns in history, dwarfing even the Normandy landings. I believe that um, uh, this history offers a, a few lessons for the strategic situation that we face today in the Taiwan Strait, <clears throat> an issue that I know uh, many of the professionals in this room and in this audience uh, are thinking deeply about. Uh, the Americans and their allies had considered invading the island of Taiwan, then called Formosa in 1944, uh, when it was a Japanese colony, this Operation Causeway. Uh, was a serious possibility. Plans were advanced, uh, and it was not until the end of September 1944 that they were finally abandoned in favor of uh, invading the Philippines and then Okinawa. Uh, we ruled out invading uh, Taiwan in 1944, but it was a close call. We could have done it. It's an interesting alternative history to consider how all of Asian history might have been different since then. Uh, had we done that, would it have involved American and allied forces more closely in the Civil War in China, for example? It appears clear that the current Chinese leadership is determined on an eventual reunification with Taiwan. Less clear is uh, their timing and their willingness to use direct military force. Uh, recent events following uh, Speaker Pelosi's uh, visit to Taipei were immensely concerning. 
Beijing reacted with furious rhetoric, cut off diplomatic channels, and fired uh, missiles into the sea. Beijing has no right to prevent foreign officials from vis visiting Taiwan. Uh, we should not be bullied on that score. President Biden articulated a U.S. commitment to come to Taiwan's defense if attacked. He made explicit a policy that had previously been only implicit. He removed uh, the strategic ambiguity around that policy. But as his administration quickly took pains to emphasize, there has been no fundamental change in U.S. policy, and there has been no departure from the one China policy, which has kept the long peace, which recognizes that Taiwan and mainland China will someday be reunited. Uh, but only on terms that uh, uh, both parties would agree to. Uh, now, much has changed since World War II, of course. I'm a historian and not a security analyst. I don't want to be glib, particularly in an audience uh, of experts like this one. Uh, in 1945, there were no, no such thing as precision-guided missiles and munitions. Submarines, of course, have much greater capabilities than they did in the 1940s. We have the entire realm of cyber warfare as a factor. We have helicopters to move trips uh, from sea to shore. That's fundamentally changed the nature of amphibious operations. And of course, in this situation, you have uh, great powers with uh, nuclear weapons. But there are certain eternal verities, I think, that apply in the realm of amphibious operations. China and Taiwan are separated by a 110 mile strait, that's five times the width of the English Channel, a major impediment to an outright amphibious invasion, a formidable moat for which the Taiwanese must be very grateful. On the other hand, Taiwan is exposed to missile and airstrikes from nearby Chinese bases, and Taiwan is 7,600 miles away from the west coast of the United States' principal ally. In the Second World War, and today, vital conditions for success in an amphibious invasion, control of the surrounding sea, control of the air above, China would need to clear the strait of any threat posed by submarines, for example, and our submarine force, I think, would have something to say about that. Rapid delivery of ground forces and heavy weaponry to the landing beaches. The value of surprise, they won't have it. They will not achieve surprise. Uh, once a lodgement is affected, the need for constant resupply by sea and reliable air protection overhead, the necessity for close clock-like precision in joint operations between the sea, the air, and the land forces. This demands excellence and adaptability from the leadership and also down the chain of command. Uh, China, if they attempt to do this, will make mistakes. Not all will go according to plan. It will be a test of leadership, efficiency, and adaptability. Is China's military built for that? Well, no one really knows. China has fought no major war since its civil war in the 1940s. Uh, our war games seem to suggest that China would likely suffer heavy losses at sea both in the initial assault phase and in the supporting operations to follow. And that the US and allies uh, could probably defeat a cross strait invasion, uh, but would likewise suffer major losses in ships, airplanes, and casualties. And if the People's Liber Liberation Army did establish a beachhead and a lodgement ashore in Taiwan, uh, <clears throat> what would they have to deal with in Taiwan on the ground? Taiwan, unlike Hong Kong, is a large, rugged landmass with a mountainous interior, population of 23 and a half million, and they have not been a united part of China for more than a century. Uh, most Taiwanese consider themselves Taiwanese and not Chinese. Polls and election results indicate that Taiwanese uh, public uh, is opposed to unification with China. Uh, their opposition to unification has grown in recent years, particularly as they've watched what has happened in Hong Kong. Uh, and the spirited fight put up by the Ukrainians uh, against the Russian invaders may have brought, uh, may have uh, both inspired the Taiwanese and perhaps given the Chinese pause 
Uh, so <clears throat> the conclusion then is that China faces major risks in such an operation. Uh, success is by no means assured. Of course, there are many alternatives to a direct invasion, escalating provocations, air overflights, missile overflights, outright air and missile strikes, a blockade. Uh, <clears throat> the People's Liberation Army could very easily snatch up uh, some of Taiwan's lightly defended outer islands. Any of these, or all of these, uh, seem the more likely route uh, to a crisis in the Taiwan Strait. And this would, of course, be a very dangerous situation, uh, akin to another Cuban Missile Crisis. And as always, the potential for an accident or miscalculation leading to sudden escalation would be very high. Uh, our uh, position is that the, uh, Beijing and Taipei may engage in direct diplomacy to arrange their political future and that we would accept the result. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, in the case of an escalation, uh, we would at the very least raise the economic costs of a war to China. Here again, the example of Russia and Ukraine uh, may be helpful to our cause. And the threat of sanctions, including multi multilateral financial sanctions to be in, supported by our allies, including Europe. Uh, here again, Russia's Ukrainian mis misadventure offers encouragement. But the cost to the global economy in any case would be very severe, perhaps catastrophic. The obvious conclusion here, I'm offering nothing other than the conventional wisdom, is that a war for Taiwan would be devastating to all parties and to the world. And our policy must be to avoid a direct military confrontation. The one China policy, an awkward fiction, has kept uh, a long-term peace for almost three quarters of a century. We should aim to preserve it uh, with chewing gum and band-aids if necessary, keep that policy together into the future. US policy should uh, be to oppose any tendency within Taiwan toward a declaration of independence. Professional warriors today and of the generation to come will face a delicate balance to face down Chinese aggression while avoiding war, to maintain a credible military deterrent while also keeping open channels to Beijing, always in the hope of allowing diplomacy to soothe tensions and if possible, to actually solve that problem. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, my name is John Michael Sheck. I'm the Chair of Theory and History at the Elite Joint Advanced Warfighting School down at Joint Forces Staff College. Um, I'll be your moderator. So first, thank you, Mr. Toll. I think uh, what we just listened to, what we have read, the studying World War II in the Pacific is a good example of why joint doctrine matters, why joint PME still matters. And while the character conduct of war constantly changes, those atolls, islands are still there, still relevant. Um, again, before we get to questions, general rules still apply, Chatham House rules. Um, and when you have your question, please state your name and your affiliation. And I believe we have online questions. We do. Uh, good morning, Captain Knight. Uh, Sir Andrew Buck from Eisenhower School uh, Air Force Civilian asks, uh, we're familiar with many of the successful amphibious invasions. Uh, can you speak to a notable failure and what lessons we can take from the defender's success? Well, it's a matter of pride, I think, to the Allies that they never actually failed in any amphibious invasion uh, in the sense of uh, actually having tried to take an island and then failed and had to withdraw. Um, <clears throat> there were a number of uh, particularly earlier in the war, uh, operations which in retrospect, uh, the mistakes had been serious and uh, as a result, we had lost uh, more uh, 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 personnel than we should have. I think there are two notable examples. Uh, the first invasion of the Central Pacific Campaign, which occurred in November 1943, we attacked two islands in the Gilbert Group and the uh, most important of those was uh, Tarawa, uh, and uh, an island in Tarawa, uh, Betio Island. Uh, 
uh, which had an important air base favorably oriented toward the prevailing winds, something that didn't exist in great abundance in that part of the world. Uh, we attacked and took that island uh, at great cost, about uh, 3,000 uh, marine casualties, including 1,000 killed in action. And in retrospect, looking at it, many charged that we could have bypassed that island. Uh, we could have essentially cut off uh, its um, air power uh, or, or the uh, Japanese ability to resupply uh, airplanes and, and supplies, neutralized it, bypassed it. And I think in retrospect, we probably should have done that. Uh, another uh, island, Peleliu in the Carolines, uh, we took in September 1944, likewise. Uh, there was a debate after the fact. Could we, should we have bypassed it uh, and saved the heavy casualties uh, taken by our Marines uh, on that island. There again, I think uh, the weight of evidence, uh, of course, ret looking back at things, you're looking in hindsight, uh, but I think it's clear that we could have bypassed as, that island as well. In general, we had the capability in the Pacific to move faster and farther than we did, uh, and bolder, more am ambitious strokes, particularly in the earlier part of the campaign, uh, would have uh, saved a number of lives and perhaps shortened the war. Sir, uh, Bryony Slaughter from the U.S. Space Force. I'm a member of uh, National War College. Um, as a member of the newest service, uh, what lessons or advice uh, could you offer from history from um, some of maybe the joint force challenges in World War II uh, would you offer to uh, the newest service as we get our feet under us and um, maybe potentially prepare for uh, a war in the Pacific again? Well, here I, again, I have to say I, I want to be humble uh, and I don't want to be glib. Uh, I am a historian. I know quite a bit about the Second World War and not a lot, of, not a lot about what Space Force uh, is doing in the way of planning uh, for a war. I would reiterate what I have said, uh, that uh, joint operations planning uh, are more essential when it comes to amphibious operations perhaps than in, in any other type of warfare. And I have no doubt that our, our Space Force uh, is uh, being closely integrated into the planning that we're doing for conflict in that region. Uh, and um, I would welcome the opportunity to learn more. Good morning, sir. Lieutenant Colonel Juliet Calvin, United States Marine Corps. Um, College of Cyberspace and Information, sir. Uh, thanks very much for your work and your discussion on the Pacific. Those battles in particular, I think, tell us a lot of lessons learned specifically for today as we're looking uh, with our eye towards the Pacific as well. Um, I'm particularly interested in the work that you've done on looking at the reflections of the civil populace. Um, both on the homeland and in foreign areas from the Pacific times. And how would you juxtapose that to today? Um, our responses from the civil populace to war uh, actions that have occurred over the past 20 years? Um, and how we project that to a future fight that potentially um, leads us back to engagements uh, that we've seen in the Pacific from our earlier battles that you discussed, sir? Yeah, it, it really is just a fact, isn't it, that uh, in a, a democracy, um, you cannot wage war effectively without the support of the people who are ultimately sovereign. And uh, <clears throat> our long uh, trial in Afghanistan and Iraq has obviously um, changed the complexion a bit in terms of uh, public support uh, for a particularly foreign um, uh, for, foreign uh, operations that would involve the United States going into a country that has not uh, taken action against us or our allies. I'm very curious to see how um, Russia's uh, misadventure in Ukraine begins to alter that picture. Uh, it's, I think, immensely encouraging how the people of Europe uh, have continued to really stand strongly uh, with Ukraine and have shown a willingness even to 
uh, suffer economic hardship in order to help the Ukrainians uh, push back the Russian aggression. Um, <clears throat> in general, I think uh, the history of the Second World War is unique, really, in our history. There's never been anything quite like that. Uh, following the strike on Pearl Harbor, uh, the isolationist movement, which had been very strong, uh, a movement against American involvement in the Second World War, uh, a movement that had strength in both parties, Republicans and Democrats, had strength in every region of the country, but particularly the Midwest. Uh, a political movement which seemed to be getting stronger, if anything, uh, in the fall of 1941 leading up to the strike on Pearl Harbor. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, literally overnight, caused that movement to collapse. Uh, the day after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Congress voted unanimously, except for one vote in the House, unanimously in the Senate, uh, to declare war on Japan. And uh, thereafter, the uh, uh, American people were largely unified around the proposition that we would have to continue this long, hard war until it was over, until the Axis was completely defeated, defeated in a way that they could not uh, again make war on their neighbors. Um, we've never really had that since, and I think you could argue we've never really had that kind of unity before either. Uh, so again, the, the Second World War is, is, is unique uh, in that way, and I think it's one of the reasons that it holds such enduring fascination and appeal uh, for us. And um, today I think it's hard to imagine a situation in which uh, we would be able to unify this country around a foreign a military um, challenge uh, the way uh, that we were able to do, to do that in the 1940s. Gentleman on my right, and then online next. Uh, Rear Admiral John Bidoff, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Friends of the, of the National uh, World War II Memorial. My question is, uh, what are your thoughts on the effectiveness of the Navy's uh, amphibious czar in the Pacific, Vice Admiral Kelly Turner, uh, who had some problems uh, working with the Marine Corps, uh, and he did not have a Mr. Rogers-like personality? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, uh, Richmond Kelly Turner, uh, was the um, really the Navy's preeminent uh, amphibious specialist uh, in the Pacific, and just now occurs to me I probably should have mentioned his name. Uh, he was uh, his nickname was Terrible Turner. Uh, Holland Smith, who I, I mentioned during my remarks, was the uh, top Marine in the Pacific for most of the war. His nickname was Howling Mad Smith. So you can imagine you have these two very combustible characters. Uh, both recognized experts in the field of amphibious warfare, both with very strong ideas about how things should be done, thrown together in a situation where they were required to jointly plan operations. Um, and yet they've managed to do it. Uh, and uh, despite the frequent shouting matches, uh, many of which have been recorded by various eyewitnesses, uh, constant appeals to Nimitz to resolve their disputes uh, they managed to plan these operations and execute them effectively, and uh, even more surprising, perhaps, after all of that, they became the best of friends and were essentially inseparable friends uh, during and after the war. I can, I have an online question I can read for you. So I have a question from Lieutenant Colonel Ron Sprang, U.S. Army, JAWS. Yesterday marked the 80th anniversary of Operation Torch. What lessons were taken from that operation and applied to the amphibious operations in the Pacific Theater? Yeah, so Torch, the, um, in our invasion of North Africa in uh, late 1943, um, <clears throat> was essentially an alternative to uh, an early invasion of France. This was a subject that uh, had bitterly divided the Allies. Uh, the Americans uh, wanted to a return to Europe, the earlier the better, George Marshall in particular, with strong backing from Ernest King and 
as well as the civilian cabinet secretaries, pushed the British, British very hard at the beginning of the war uh, to try to plan for an early strike across the English Channel, no later than 1943, and possibly even in 1942 on an emergency basis uh, if um, it appeared that the Russians were going to break through in the east. Of course, the objective there was to get to, uh, to Germany before the Red Army swallowed it up. <clears throat> um, that uh, long, bitter argument uh, was resolved eventually by Churchill realizing that he would have to give the Americans an alternative. Uh, and so uh, he uh, proposed and backed uh, this idea of a landing in North Africa and uh, developing a, a sort of a southern soft underbelly attack on the Third Reich. Um, the, uh, it, it was a, a large uh, landing and, and yet one in which we never really had to, to land under fire in a big way. Uh, and so it was a I think useful as an exercise to begin developing those procedures um, without uh, uh, the risk of suffering a, a major defeat uh, while trying to land on a hostile coast. Sir, uh, thank you. This is Lieutenant Colonel Etienne, the College of Information and Cyberspace. I just wanted to uh, see if you could give us some insight on uh, the effectiveness of the MAGIC intercept program and, and what role it played in the successes in the Pacific for the Allied forces. Yeah, absolutely. So um, <clears throat> in general, uh, our um, intelligence community had extraordinary success uh, in breaking into Japanese communications. This was in the early days of um, uh, crypt crypt uh, cryptological warfare. This was something new. Uh, many of the uh, leaders of our military services had uh, little understanding of what it was. Uh, the magic intercepts um, were the um, Japanese diplomatic communications. Uh, their State Department, Foreign Ministry, was using uh, a particular code to communicate between the Foreign Ministry in Tokyo and the embassies abroad. We broke into that code and essentially were able to read all of their diplomatic mail for the entire course of the war. And this was an extraordinary insight. Uh, it didn't give us a lot of information about uh, their direct military planning simply because Japanese diplomats were not informed uh, about that at all. They were kept in the dark largely by the militarist regime about uh, military plans and operations. Uh, but to be able to read uh, the diplomatic mail as comprehensively as we did uh, was an Im immensely powerful um, advantage that we had through the war. For example, a strike on Pearl Harbor, uh, we essentially had read the traffic between Tokyo and the embassy here in Washington before the Japanese ambassador showed up at the State Department to announce a break off of negotiations, which was tantamount to a declaration of war. Uh, most importantly, I think in the last year of the war, um, we were able to uh, follow very closely the Japanese government's attempt to bring Moscow, to bring Stalin, uh, in as a mediator to try to negotiate peace between the Allies and Japan. Uh, the hope there was that um, uh, the Soviet Union would, would see uh, an advantage to propping up militarist Japan as a kind of buffer state uh, and that uh, Stalin might then step in and offer to facilitate peace talks. Um, following all of that, uh, our leadership was able to put one and one together and to realize that the, there was a, a move in Japan uh, to try to make peace. It was a desperate move. Uh, and that um, under the right circumstances, it would be possible that the a regime in Tokyo would agree to accept uh, our terms, uh, which had been spelled out in the Potsdam Declaration. So uh, for all of those reasons, the magic intercepts were uh, an immensely significant factor in the Pacific. Good morning, sir. My name is Barrett Bradstreet. I'm, uh Lieutenant Colonel in the Marine Corps and a student at the National War College. Thanks very much for coming today. 
I, I hope maybe you could educate me about the five years after the war and how uh, the experience of uh, general officers and flag officers informed the uh, formation of the Joint Chiefs. Uh, I have the impression from uh, Rick Atkinson that the fact that uh, uh, the American military officers tended to get their clock cleaned by the British uh, led them to up their game a level or two. I also have a vague sense that some aversion to the German general staff model animated uh, thinking. And I wonder if you could talk about uh, the degree to which the general officers and admirals had a role in the formation and to what degree uh, the decisions were largely civilian-led. Sure. Well, um, <clears throat> yeah, I'd, I'd foreshadowed that, that tremendous political bureaucratic uh, struggle to reorganize the military. Uh, and the way that our, our military leaders really saw this, this thing coming uh, during the course of the war and were positioning themselves in a sense. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the Navy, uh, the Marines, the Army, and the Army Air Forces, which became the Air Force, they all had their own priorities, uh, their own objectives. Um, the Marines and the Air Force uh, generally wanted independence and achieved it, of course. Uh, the Navy was very concerned, I think with good reason, uh, that they would be the losers uh, in this reorganization. Uh, there are a number of reasons for that. Um, FDR had been a Navy man, former Assistant Secretary of the Navy, uh, that essentially had treated the Navy as sort of his pet service. Uh, the Army leadership had uh, understood that problem, seen it as a manageable problem. When FDR died, he uh, was replaced in office by Harry Truman, who had served in the Army uh, in the First World War. And uh, there was a feeling uh, within the Navy that uh, Truman didn't understand them well uh, and uh, would need to be educated. The uh, fleet that we built, uh, particularly in the Pacific, uh, had to be downsized very, very radically. Uh, at the end of the war, simply because we didn't need it and because it was expensive. Um, <clears throat> but to, the uh, admirals really uh, saw this as a threat to the, to the um, uh, essentially the continuation of the naval mission, reorganization they saw as a, as a major threat. And there uh, was a, an episode known as the revolt of the admirals uh, when you essentially had um, uh, open dissent uh, to the uh, civilian uh, leadership and, and even to the president <clears throat> and uh, um, implicit threat by many senior officers to resign and take their case to the public. Uh, so it was a tremendous uh, struggle, obviously. Um, and uh, as you say, I think particularly early in the war, uh, there was a feeling among our chiefs in Washington uh, that the British had uh, built a well-oiled machine uh, for planning. Uh, and that um, they were arriving at these uh, frequent allied conferences through 1942 much better prepared uh, than uh, our leaders were. Uh, that our chiefs were uh, much more sort of throwing out ideas uh, rather than coming with um, uh, well-vetted plans. And so I think all of that played into the a feeling that we needed to establish uh, an, an organization uh, which we have today at the Pentagon uh, to uh, to do all of this in a, a more rational, systematic way. All right, I, g I got the signal. That's it's General Plain. <laughs> Mr. Toll, thank you for an incredibly educational presentation. I would like to take the privilege of the podium and ask the final question, if I may. So you did mention the role of surprise in amphibious operations. I am curious about the role of surprise in amphibious operations in the Pacific, particularly with respect to what we did in Operation Overlord in the European theater Prime Minister Winston Churchill's famous quote that the truth is so important it must be protected by a bodyguard of lies. So 
following on to that, then what would you extrapolate modern technology portends for achieving surprise in future amphibious operations as well? <clears throat> well, if you, if you listen to the uh, security analysts who know more about this, which probably include a significant portion of this audience, uh, the pe peculiar danger um, posed by a cyber attack to precede a military attack uh, really alters the entire picture. And um, uh, what more can one say except to guard against it, uh, to develop the defenses, and to be ready? Well, thank you very much. And one of our primary purposes, particularly with these President Lecture Series presentations and the coursework we do throughout the year, is to extract the lessons of history in a case study format and help our students, soon to be graduates, all of whom will be senior leaders in their organizations, US military, partner nation and allied militaries, US agencies, and help them apply those to future challenges. I think you've done that exceptionally well for us today, sir. I would note the importance of where this discussion sits in the year with tomorrow being the 247th birthday of our United States Marine Corps with Friday being Veterans Day and certainly our thanks to everyone who has served in their military either in the United States military or our partners and allies. I am keenly aware that there's nothing we do today that wasn't enabled by those who came before us, sir, and I think you've given us uh, ample examples of that today and I would like to thank you on behalf of the entire National Defense University. Thank you, General.